Let me take you to a place that we all dream of. A country which is virtual, which is borderless, which is completely digitized, and which is blockchained, and which is also, also completely like in your smartphone. I'm not talking about Germany, definitely not. I'm not talking about UK, I'm talking about Estonia. And as we all know, in Estonia, you know, like it's as easy to like get your ID to you know found a, a company. You don't have to go anywhere, you just do it with your smartphone. So they have a completely e-residency established, and we want to know how. In the world, did they do that? To talk and to tell us more about it, I'm very happy that he came here today to the conference to tell us about it. He is uh, picked in uh, Estonia by Forbes magazine uh, as one of uh, the 30 under 30. He studied in Lancaster, UK, and he uh, came back to his home country by a a uh, program which is very um, honorable. He has been chosen as one of the talents of his country and now serves as the managing director of e-residency of the Republic Estonia. And he's going to talk about in his keynote about how Estonia established e-residency. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kaspar Korius. Thank you and hi everyone. Uh, I'm honored to be here and um, at the moment I'm none of those things which he mentioned. I'm a father at home with my kids, so a longer paternity leave and, uh, and uh, happy to come here also. Uh, what I'll try to do is in the next minutes is to take this narrower approach of digital society in general and how this digital society matters and where it can all go to, where it all these digital things in nationwide can lead to in next few decades, decades of times. And, uh, and to do that, I will go back a bit from history to see and uh, understand how nations kind of started and, uh, and what's the role of humans inside of them. So if humans have been existed for millions of years, gathered in groups of 20 conquering different lands and uh, arguably their life was pretty good. Their working hours were less than today and they were rather happy. And the uh, agriculture in revolution just kicked in like 12,000 years ago. Fairly new thing, right? People started gathering in groups of 100s, uh, domesticated animals stayed in local positions and working hours were very long. But they survived for longer and they managed to grow bigger families. The Industrial Revolution, as you know here especially well, kicked in just, just some hundreds of years ago. And uh, I don't know how beautiful is the picture, but, but then really like people started to work as we know it is today. And because of that, it helped to emerge the concept of nation stage, which is just a few hundred years old concept. So, in the history of humans living here, it's quite a fairly new thing. So, let's not assume that it any house stays as it is today. The problem with nation state is that it's like a lottery. You were lucky to be born here in Germany. This is a picture of one nation state, one border which this, uh, separates two different nation states. Some may prefer to live on one side, others may prefer to live in other side. But what matters is that 
that is like a lottery of your life. Like imagine what I like to say that if you were born on Facebook and you were randomly allocated to one Facebook group and you need to live there forever. You know, there are great Facebook groups like e-residency group, but there are groups where one of my neighbor is, for example, that the earth is flat. You know, and you need to stay there, that the earth is flat and listen to that talk every day about the values of the earth and stuff like that. And uh, I wouldn't stand that. And that's why many people don't stand the way they were allocated today. The values of those nations don't just match with the values of who you are. And whether we have that democracy or not, where you have a vote to say, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't change that much. So, and, and because of the automatization, now we are living in a time where the question is, why should I stay there where I am? Where should I live? I can do remote work. I can raise my kids. I was just with my family one month in Thailand. Now I will be three months in Italy. Like, I'm country independent in that sense already now. And what's the role of nation state and how can tech help nations to stay relevant again? Is the question I'll try to help some other nations also to understand. And uh, for today, I give you 10 phases of tech adoption in governments. And uh, I'm not saying that those phases are like in the right order or all of them will happen. And I'm not saying that it is definitely going to happen. I'm rather, we can't take it for granted. But it is one option how I see that uh, the world is going to uh, be with us uh, when it comes to nation states. So let's take uh, together those 10 phases. Phase one, I'll call it faking digital. This is a uh, where you have those scanners and uh, signatures which you put on paper and then you do pictures and then you send them and attach them. And uh, in Estonia, at least, we skipped that phase, so we don't have it. Uh, and I call it faking digital because you actually, it's not digital, you just print out the same forms and you do it not digitally. And then you can send it via email uh, because of the internet connections and stuff. Uh, but it actually doesn't really smoothen any process or change any process. Here, where most nations today are. Phase two is switching to really becoming a digital nation. To become a digital nation, we need to know who you are on internet, like we know who you are on uh, real life with passports, hence the innovations of digital identities, which 30 plus nations already have in the world. Most of them don't use them. Uh, and, uh, and online applications that if I don't need to print anything out, if I want to apply for something, then I just online application and I digitally sign that and I submit that. So I think it's really good progress. It ha a bit less hassle with your government uh, to do some things. What really helps to smoothen the hassle freeness uh, with your government is, uh, is phase three, so operating efficiently. This is a screenshot of an Estonian example, how Estonia sold that. So I'll, I'll bring the Estonia as an example of those different phases, but each nation has their own way how they have sold that. Uh, this is the data exchange layer of Estonia. So this is a screenshot how data is exchanged in Estonia. Uh, it's, in Estonia, it's called X-Road. So each of the ministries and each of the private sector owns its own data set, and it's all decentralized. So there is no uh, one single point of failure. And uh, if I log into the system, let's say to the tax system, uh, I can give allowance to the tax office to access my other sort of data from different current entities. What's my salary? What's my, how many properties I own, etc. It gathers all the data for me and does the magic calculations and I just have to digitally sign and accept and I have declared my taxes. The same way with driving license, healthcare, everything else. What's important is, of course, saying that in Germany, I own my data. I can give access to access my data in different uh, departments and each of that is logged through blockchain and I can see who has access what data and when and if they, I can ask why did you access that data and if they didn't have right to do that then they will lose their license. It's all encrypted, it's all, uh, no one can access that without uh, my knowledge. 
And I will say that this is making me and the citizens trust the government. I don't trust governments which deals on paper because I don't know where are is my records, who changes my records, who sees my records. I can trust the government which is digital because I can trust mathematics and I can trust encryption. And this makes the society efficient because anymore I don't need to go to any government office to ask any papers to fill any forms. I can just give allowance to access all the existing things that is already there. And governments, also in paper-based governments, have the information about you anyway. Phase four, becoming borderless. Then the question is, if everything is working efficiently, everyone can access their services. For example, last four times I've been voting in Estonia, I did it uh, through digital channels. I wasn't in Estonia, I was still part of my democracy. The question is, why should we offer those services to those citizens alone who happen to born there? Hence, uh, this, when the previous innovations uh, in Estonian example, this was 15 years ago and ID card 20 years ago, uh, then this is 2014, uh, when I started run e-residency. So when the project is e-residency, anyone in the world can become our digital citizen. And here I just show, a, it's a bit promotional video, but uh, bear with me, a two minute video about e-residency, then I don't need to explain. Our new digital world knows no borders. And great business ideas are no longer limited by where you work or live. E-Estonia is a digital nation for global citizens. For those who've thrown off the shackles of national boundaries. Literally anyone in the world can apply. E-Residency is legitimate and transparent. A government-issued digital identity that gives you the freedom to run a global EU company online from anywhere in the world. Establish a company within a day. Access business banking. Use international payment providers. Digitally sign documents and contracts. And declare Estonian taxes online. We're Estonia. Tech is our expertise. And through e-residency, we are empowering entrepreneurs everywhere. No matter where you were born, no matter what passport you carry, you can apply. Use e-residency to run your business from anywhere in the world. Unleash your entrepreneurial potential, because no business should be bound by physical borders. Apply for e-residency today and join our new digital nation. e-resident.gov.ee So with this, we're becoming borderless, meaning that we don't need to serve and cater only those people who happen to be born in Estonia. Now Estonia is open for everyone. And it's important to become borderless, especially if you're a small nation, because your market is just so small. We have 1.3 million people living there, and, uh, and we just wouldn't compete otherwise. When it comes to e-residency today, then it's a business environment, and, uh, and taxes are usually paid in the country where people are living, so, uh, and the tax information is transparently sent between two countries, but just it gives access to services and makes your life hassle-free. And today there are over uh, 30,000 e-residents already running over 5,000 companies, and, uh, and I see that in coming years' time there are more e-resident companies than Estonians, and in 10 or so years' time, it can be the major source of income to Estonia. So it can also transform the revenue models for a nation state. Because you don't have kind of limits how many people can be involved with your nation. So that was the part of me marketing e-residency. Uh, the next phase is becoming also independent from your physical land. Land is great, I'm not saying that, and Estonia also, all those pictures are also taken from Estonia. It's, uh, but if something would happen to the land, then we would still like to survive and keep living and keep working for our nation. So what we did as in Estonia, we made data embassies so that we, for example, in Luxembourg, there is embassy where is data center, and if something happens to the physical land, then not all the data is only transferred there, but services are kept up and running. So I can still vote, I can still pay taxes, we can still have parliament meetings. 
without physical land. So our country keeps running on a cloud. Uh, phase six, building an app store. We are kind of there in Estonia, but we are actually not anymore really there. So all the following things are kind of hypothesis from my side also, what it could be. We have private sector, of course, who are being part of this ecosystem, offering services also to uh, citizens through this uh, infrastructure. But what I mean here more is that actually all the government services is built by private sector um, by launching a full set of APIs, meaning that police don't need to build its police applications, its passport applications. Driving license uh, institution doesn't need to build that. You just give APIs and eventually you have tens of different services for your citizens and the residents and they can choose the best ones. Uh, and you full, fully open this market for private sector and then governments uh, become really efficient. Phase six, what I see, becoming invisible. So far, always government is still a hassle. All of those things, you still need to do something for the government. Becoming invisible is that we have some pilot projects now ongoing that you actually, when my baby boy was born, yes, I didn't need to go to different government emb embassies kind of to, to apply for kindergarten positions, social benefits, but they still had to do it online myself. Uh, becoming invisible is that when I'll give allowance to na a nation to work for me. Meaning that if my child was born, that automatically all the benefits have been received. I'll give allowance my nation to give me pensions automatically when I turn 65, instead of me going to apply to get pensions. And once nation starts to become automatically working for you, it's becoming invisible. Hence, first time a nation is not burdening me with all their stuff. Phase eight tokenizing ecosystem, becoming independent from financial system also inside your nation. The ways of taxation today, it's great or not great, but it's just one way of how you revenue your nation, how you build up your revenue models. If you're a startup, you know that you can pivot different business models all days long, and there are different ways how to do it. There are also for nations different ways how to raise funds. One idea I proposed for Estonia uh, last summer was to do an initial coin offering of Est coins, national crypto tokens, so that every person on the planet can be become real, really part of e Estonia and e residency, really own some value of that. Like you own tokens or shares of company, why shouldn't you own tokens or shares of a nation state if you believe in that nation state in hope that in future the value of the token will be increased and also those tokens could be used to exchange value inside the community of e-residents. Hence it would really become independent also financially from its own citizens. Phase nine, empowering AI. This here when it becomes a bit scary already for me. Uh, we are allowing AI-based services to do decisions for us today all the time. So first, let's admit that. The restaurants I'm choosing, I'm, uh, I'm relying on AI, which I prefer. Um, the nightclubs where I'm going, I, I allow them to do suggestions. The movies I watch at Netflix, it's AI which makes those suggestions. So I will give part of my life to the AI already now. The question is, do I want only private sector to run my world? And I hear I would argue strongly that no. I would like that there would be regulated and also some nations part of that AI network which starts helping our world in future. Because private sector is mostly motivated because of financial rewards. And they may recommend me those restaurants which pay them more or those movies which pay them more. So I would like that there would be nation states who would offer that AI for us and work also for the nation, for the decisions. For example, if in Berlin you have some economic turndown coming in three years' time, then AI most probably knows that before your civil servants and can re do recommendations to lower level of taxes in that region or to hire 
thousands of new employees in that sector because uh, that is going to boom in five years' time. All of those national decisions can be done and run also by AI. And once this powerful network is already working for us, instead of allowing humans to do mistakes all over again, we can start considering merging societies. Because if there is very powerful networks working for humans, why should you invent one yourself, join to this network? And this is happening on some level already with Estonia, for example, with uh, Finland, we launched, to, uh, now we have integrated our infrastructure so that we can exchange data between nations. Uh, in the EU, we have the EIDAS, we can, uh, uh, we can read each other digital identities and, uh, and legally they are binding. Last week, I came from South Korea where we had a deal uh, there where they are going to promote e residency uh, and we are going to promote their uh, citizens to enhance uh, uh, businesses between the regions. But this is, of course, longer future when eventually they are really emerged. And my point may be being that I see that and I believe that nations are becoming independent from its own physical land, citizens, services, revenue and start serving humans as never before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kaspar. I didn't Please, finish uh, yet. I didn't finish yet. You didn't? Okay. <laughs> but I, I would like maybe those things we, we can discuss we, together also. Exactly. Like, uh, we would like to invite uh, Nico Luma, please, to the stage because we have to, yeah. have to run a little bit. But you can... You can, uh, you I, can have, I have two things which you may ask or if you're interested. One because thing we have is many questions from yes, the, the myth of why one nation can't do that, which I wrote down some of the main things and then uh, some questions to you also. But I will stay, leave the myth on the stage. Thank you so much uh, and sorry for interrupting because we have so many questions by the audience that I want to, because I don't want to yeah. spare the, 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 the questions here. So. Um, first of all, you uh, just uh, finished by saying that you want to merging societies. And there's a question by Anonymous. <laughs> um, how has the recent American Western view on moving to isolation impacted your mm -hmm. movement yeah. to, to merge mm -hmm. societies? Yeah. Uh, first remark is that I don't... By merging, uh, we need to understand that there wouldn't be like one government who ru rules us or it's just the AI which kind of knows it can be 10 different governments once it's like merged. <laughs> but the, the AI is powerful there. Uh, second, to consider this borders, what is going to happen now in the world. Like when you consider this road map, which I showed you from the millions of years till now, the world is always becoming smaller and smaller. We started, yes, we spread around the world, but then we started communicating uh, through birds, then through telephones, you know, then through Skype. Uh, we, the locations are becoming smaller. It's, it's cheaper to fly to each other. So the world is becoming smaller anyway. I'm traveling here with my ID card in my pocket. I applied US visa still like uh, within minutes and I don't feel borders anymore, like in old days. So even if these short-term things, we see borders, the world is becoming global because of the knowledge of the Wikipedias, of the AIs, which make us closer. And I see that very temporary thing. Temporary can be a few hundred years. Uh, to have those borders uh, physically also stronger then. Before we move on to the next question, let me introduce you to Nico. He's I, I don't have to introduce him. He's kind of a mascot here for uh, 48 Forward. We're going to hear his thoughts uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a bit. But um, Nico, um, you are like coaching. You're like um, uh, telling people what to do online, especially like the party, which you're, uh, uh, SPD, which is in deep trouble here in Germany right now. <coughs> what do you think is harder to digitize a party or to digitize a, a society or a country? Um, actually, I, I don't think you can, you, you can like take that apart. I think you have to do both. And um, it's, it's very complex. I mean, I've been talking about digitalization for like over 20 years now. And um, 
I remember in 97 when I urged the, the local party chapter in Hamburg to set up a web server. Um, everybody in the organization was first against it because they said, you know, we get calls, we get letters, and we get faxes, and now we should do email as well. We can't handle that load, you know, and so people were against it. And I said, no, I mean, we have to do this. I mean, there are other people who want to communicate via the web. And um, that's a long process. And, and now, 20 years later, of course, you can communicate via email and WhatsApp and whatnot. It just takes time. And, and, and of course, you always, in, at least in, in, in Germany and, and especially at the Social Democratic Party, you always have this idea about not leaving people behind. It's, you know, um, we want to broaden um, the, the amount of participation. And so it's hard to leave people behind. So we have been talking from the beginning about the digital divide. And um, that's something that I never experienced when, when I go to, to, to Estonia. Nobody talks about a possible digital divide. Nobody talks about how complicated it could be for an old um, a senior citizen to, to do the stuff that you guys do digitally. In Germany, that's always a big thing. What do you do about the offliners? What do you do? What do you do? We have to take them along. We have to build something, build a bridge. And I have, I mean, my, my perception at least in, uh, from Estonia is, um, it just works, and it, it happens, and it's easy, and people get, get accustomed to that. And here, it's just, it just takes so much time because you don't want to leave anyone behind. But that that actually done. is a real question. I mean, it's not completely nonsense to ask, how do you yeah. make like people who are, like, let's say, older people, yeah. let's say people who are just you know, like not familiar to, to, yeah. to do everything online, how yeah. do you yeah. make sure that nobody's left behind? So two or three uh, points here. First, let's not discriminate older people because in Estonia statistics, older people prefer more to do digital stuff. Many matters because it's cheaper, easier. Uh, we have also snow all times. They don't want to go voting outside to the booth. They want to do it online. So, but there is definitely a group of people like with every technology adoption where there are laggards and late adapters yeah. who don't want those stuff. And it's all right, the nation's obligation is to keep all the services physical and digital up and running all the time so that people have a choice to do. Uh, so this is still there in Estonia, it's just once after 20 years, it takes time, laggards will join also. Uh, but the first part is how to get it kick, uh, starting is, uh, is training. In Estonia, there are lots of training. I personally, seven years ago, uh, where I actually met my dear wife, was we had this mobile booth where we put to the different supermarkets and I help people to digital design how we put your ID card into computer and how you do signing like and uh, we trained 100,000 Estonians like that it's 10% of us and they trained their parents uh, and etc so and this training was just one thing how society becomes digital uh, education is one part of that and you met your wife there yes oh see so i'm uh, all my life is this plastic yeah. id card person unfortunately see, I, <laughs> I, I help uh, train students to go online in, in the late 90s in, at my university, and that's where I met my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to talk <laughs> about the future of love in a bit, but let's stay with government and let's stay with uh, some really uh, amazing questions that came in. Hans-Peter Huber wants to know, would you offer white label, your, would you white label your solution for a e-Bavaria or e-Catalonia yeah. or e-Vatican? <laughs> Yeah, and this is, uh, this is what we do actually. All of our stuff is open source. So our wow. X-Road is open source in GitHub. Digital Identity is uh, open source. You can see how it's done. Our, we have all the APIs, open APIs there, for example, establishing company open APIs. Uh, so all of that is out there. And usually it's not a matter about technology. It's only a matter about people's will to do it. Which brings us to the uh, number one questions. Trust is key. How did you foster this? I have to admit, like 20 years ago, the situation was different. So we can't kind of compare. 20 years ago, when Estonia got free independent, 20 plus years ago, kind of, we didn't, no one asked in Estonia, how do you keep my data? <laughs> you know, do you check my data? You know, you just got independent. Uh, so things should be done differently today. But my point is that today, technology helps us. And Germany is very technology oriented nation in general and it shouldn't it should be possible to explain that that even the cancerer can't encrypt encrypted things if he or she doesn't have 
private key of yours. You know, if it's blockchain, how old records are there, how you can actually see and trust those technology things. More, it's always comparison, more than paper-based societies. I don't understand how can you trust your paper societies more than digital, I really don't understand. I, how do you know who changed your healthcare records at the moment? Or who made a copy of that? Or where are they anyway? Like, you don't have any overview of that. So don't come and say that digital can't be trusted. Let me ask the... Uh, but, but, you know, that's really uh, yeah. a, a matter of, you know, the right mindset. You know, and in, in, in Germany, you always think about data privacy first, and you think about, you know, more data is kind of evil. And, okay. you know, but, and, and in, other, in other okay, societies, let me, you think about the possibilities Yeah, first, but, but, you know? but, but that is a good, good point, and Nico brings up. Um, as we know in China, for instance... China is very eager to get the data of the people. There is a scoring system yeah. going on, whereas like, if you don't behave accordingly to the rules set up by the party, you actually are in deep trouble. You are not allowed to visit a university to get a degree and so on. Your whole f family actually gets punished. So how can we actually make sure to bring that like, to a dystopian kind of a version? Yeah. And which is a, which is a, a threat. This is yeah. not just us yeah. Germans being like crazy or something. That a e residency doesn't turn out to become a resident evil. Yeah, very nice phrase. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like uh, separate technology with how and what you can do. Like technology is there and you can use it for good and worse. So first of all, not to blame encryption or blockchain or digital identities if something bad happens then it's just bad management uh, so we don't need to be afraid of technology the question is many nations not only now china uh, can now really uh, uh, misuse that also uh, atar in india is very powerful they gain one billion digital identities within some years of time like literally one sixth of the world population has uh, Indian digital identity, you know. But if the data protection acts are not there, if people don't own their data, and if the technology is not built like that way, then everything can be misused and you shouldn't you go forward. But nowadays, you should start with this legislation part and technology part correctly, and it's possible to put those legislations in place. Like in Estonia, it happened twice, police officer checked the ex-girlfriend's data and one a medical person checked their data. And once the police lost the license, a medical doctor lost the license of after 30 years of studying medical in school, within one mistake you lose your license. You don't do it again. You know? and, uh, and these things need to be in place. Uh, so you do have a system of checks and balances. So it's not going to get definitely. abused. And big data, like government has your data anyway. And uh, government has, if you want, like, Government can ask in data from Google's or Apple's if they don't have something, and they, then they have that data from you. So it's not about that government doesn't have your data, just uh, whether it takes uh, one week for the government to gather your data, or it takes one second, it, that shouldn't be the question. The question should be that you own your data and you have an overview of that, and you can decide what to do with that data. Like, it's not that you shouldn't become a lot of hassle, like today I heard complaints about that you can't park here with application, that you have those coins where you need to enter that because of data protection stuff. Like those things can be solved through technology. You shouldn't like live in past because to be afraid of that. Like, uh, and of course, governments have misused that like before, but before we didn't have that capabilities in technology, what we have today. So we should give like opportunity to give the second try for governments. And it's up to us citizens, kind of, to give that, because politicians won't do it themselves if you're against that. Kind of. Thank you so much for like this really insightful talk that you gave and the questions. Are you going to stay here for, for until the lunch break, maybe? At least lunch break. Yeah. Lunch break. So please uh, grab this guy. I have plenty of questions. I see you still have some questions, but we must continue. And I thank you so much for, for coming here and to bring that to yeah. us here, to Munich. Thank you so much. Kasper Koyus, thank you so okay. much.